Welcome back to our study over the book of Hebrews. We've been going through this book the last few weeks, and hopefully you've been following along with the reading plan, and you've been digging into the book of Hebrews, but also to other messages and verses and chapters in Scripture elsewhere, and allowing those um, outside sources from outside of the book of Hebrews to impact your reading of the book. We've been saying throughout this uh, these teaching videos how important it is to have the Old Testament in one hand while you have the book of Hebrews in the other hand. And we'll see that to be especially true again today as we dive into the text for this week. So the text for this week was Hebrews 4, verse 14 through chapter 6, verse 20. And, and the big picture, last week we talked about how Jesus was superior, Jesus is superior to Moses, and the author sets Moses against Jesus and, and establishes the promised peace, the promised rest in Jesus um, compared to that of Moses in the promised land. And before that, he establishes the superiority of Jesus to the angels, to other messengers of God, showing that Jesus is more than just a messenger, he is God. And today we see that Jesus is superior to the priesthood, that he is the perfect high priest. So let's dig right into here, jumping into verses 14 through 16. What does it mean to what 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 does it mean that Jesus is the high priest? Well it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our Confession. Now, remember, we said last time that anytime we see a therefore, we have to look and see what is it there for. So, what is that therefore, therefore? Well, we have to go back a little bit into verses 12 and 13 and, and uh, verses, uh, verse 11. And if we go to verse 11 of chapter 4, it's the verse, let us then make every effort to enter that rest. So, the author is encouraging those who are the church, those who are believers, to make every effort to enter the promised rest that comes through Jesus, which is different than the promised land that was offered to the Israelites through Moses' ministry. We enter the promised rest through Jesus. Now, he continues on and says, For the word of God is living and active. And we said last week that. That reference word is the Greek word logos, which is used by John in his gospel to identify to Jesus, that, that Jesus is the revelation of God. And it is through Jesus that God penetrates our hearts. And therefore, the author of Hebrews is saying, since we have this great high priest. So now what that means is the author is using this line here, great high priest, and he's establishing that with the Logos, with the Word. He is saying that the Word is the great high priest, which is why we can't simply take that passage in Hebrews 4, 12, and 13 to mean that the author is speaking solely about scriptures, but he's going beyond scriptures, and he's talking about Jesus. That Jesus is the Word, and Jesus is our great high priest. Scripture isn't a high priest. Jesus is the great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Remember, th this is a new section in, in, in our text. Whenever we're reading an English translation, there's often headings and subheadings in our Bible. But in the ancient text, it, it all runs together. And so it's, you don't have as much separation of the text Verses 11, 12, and 13 lead directly into verse 14. The original reader, the original audience would have, I mean, identified almost right away that the high priest is the Word, and that means the Word is Jesus. Because the, the author of Hebrews here identifies the great high priest as Jesus, the Son of God, who has passed through the heavens. But he goes beyond this and he says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in every way, as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. So, now that we're 
moving a little bit past Moses and a little bit past the promised land, we have to, in order to understand what the author of Hebrews is getting at here, we have to have a little bit of background into the priesthood. What is the role of the priest? What's the role of the priesthood? So if we draw a diagram here of the tabernacle, and I'm a horrible drawer, so I'm sorry about that, but the tabernacle courts, we have, this would be the, the wall or what surrounds the tabernacle. So this is the, the book of Exodus, the book of Leviticus and Numbers depict for us the tabernacle and the tabernacle's depiction is what Solomon used when he built the temple and what the, the first century temple was then based off of as well. So this here is the tabernacle dwelling. This here is the tabernacle uh, fence or gate, as it will. And you have the entrance at this point here. As you come through the entrance, you have an altar. And that altar is where people would bring their sacrifices. But the average Joe isn't able to place their sacrifice on the altar. They bring it to a priest. And that priest takes the sacrifice and burns it on the altar. Now, that is the practice of a priest. But then there's the high priest. So we can draw a bigger priest. That's the high priest. And the high priest cleanses the tabernacle is making sure that the dwelling place of God is without the imperfections of humanity's corruption. And so now we look at this inside dwelling here that's inside the temple gates, and this is the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is called the holy place, and then the most holy place. And the most holy place was where the Ark of the Covenant sat. That was the throne room of God amongst his people. And in the holy place, there were other things that represented God's dwelling with his people, the lampstands, the altar of the bread of pre or the table with the bread of presence and, and incense bowls. There's all sorts of different um, adornments with inside the tabernacle that represented different things. But the role of the high priest was to ensure that the holy place and the tabernacle remained a place of communion between God and his people. But only the high priest could make offerings and could could cleanse and, and could come before God in the most holy place. And even then, this happened once a year on what's called the Day of Atonement, when the high priest would enter into the holy place, cleanse it, make an offering before God. And when he entered into that most holy place, they would tie a rope around his ankle because there was always the chance that the high priest hadn't properly cleansed himself, hadn't properly rid himself of any sin, hadn't properly rid himself of any unrighteousness. And if he entered that most holy place in a state of unrighteousness or a state of impurity, he would die. And so they tied a rope around his ankle in order to pull him out so no one else went in there and died as well. Because the point is, even the high priest was unrighteous. There was no perfect high priest, and yet the people needed someone to act in that way, to try to be the mediator before God and man, but no one was able to do it perfectly. No one was able to exactly be what the high priest was meant to be. And the author of Hebrews alludes to this. He continues on in chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed in matters pertaining to God for the people. To offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray, since he is also clothed with weakness. Because of this, because he is clothed with weakness, he must make an offering for his own sins as well as for the people. And so there's this emphasis by the author of Hebrews that the high priest he acts as this intermediary, he serves the people, he is offering the sacrifices, but it's also for himself, to cleanse himself. The high priest of Israel was always imperfect. There was always unrighteousness resting within the high priest of Israel. So Israel needed a greater high priest, which is why when we go back up to here, we needed someone who could sympathize with us but who is also of the heavens. Someone who is God but can sympathize with us. Someone who is humanity, who is human, 
but is also fully God. That was what we truly needed in order to be able to commune and, and come before the throne room of God. Now, the question that, that we have to ask ourselves is, well, we see clearly that the author of Hebrews identifies Jesus as this high priest. The question that often comes up is, who is he the high priest for? Is Jesus the high priest only for the church? Is he the high priest for all of humanity, whether they're believing in him or not? Is it possible that you can be a part of God's people at one point and say, you know, I'm not, you know, I gave my, came to him once, I'm, I'm done now. This is an important question because if we look into the, the, the book of Hebrews, he begins this discourse on Jesus being the high priest by explaining what it means for Jesus to be the high priest. But he doesn't elaborate on this. So what, what this tells us is that it was common understanding that the church identified Jesus in this role as the high priest, as the intermediary between God and his people. Because in verse 1 of chapter 6, the teacher says, Therefore, let us leave elementary teaching about Christ and go on uh, to maturity. <laughs> so this might not sound elementary to you or I, but this was basic understanding about Jesus' role by the time that this teaching was circulating among the church in the first century, that it was elementary theology that Jesus is the high priest. But the teacher is saying, we need to take a step beyond this. We need to understand what this means for us. And he goes into this passage that could be highly controversial. It's scripture, so it's not controversial, it's true. But there's it can be interpreted and understood, misconstrued, misapplied in different ways. And so let's read this together, Hebrews 6, 4 through 8. It says, For it is impossible to renew to repentance those who once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's good word and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away. And so what is often asked here is, is does this mean it is possible for someone to lose their salvation? Is it possible for someone to come to the high priest at one point and reject the high priest at a later point? Well, it seems here that the author of Hebrews is saying it is possible for that. But if we are good understanders and, and good listeners of Scripture, then we can recall some of Jesus' teaching in the book of John. Here's what Jesus says in John 6, 37 through 40. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those who have given me, who, who none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I'll raise them on the last day. So in one instance here, we, we see this emphasis from the teacher of Hebrews, seemingly, that it is possible for those who have come to Christ, who have renewed their repentance, who have offered their sacrifice, so to speak, the sacrifice of their life to Jesus, it is possible for them to fall away. Because he is saying it's impossible to renew them back to repentance once they have fallen away. But in another sense, Jesus is saying, all of those who have come to me according to my Father's will won't fall away. I will raise them up. Everyone who believes in me will have eternal life. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, is how is this not a contradiction? How do we come to an understanding that it's, it's possible for no one that Jesus has brought into salvation to fall away, but at the same time, the author of Hebrews is saying those who have fallen away can't come back. So he's emphasizing that can't. And here's, here's what I want to take away from this. If you think about the, the Israelites, the Old Testament, how many of them were nominal Israelites? And, and what I mean by this is how many of them would go through the motions, would 
place their sacrifice at the temple. They would you know, do a good dance, play the part, but then go back to their dwelling place and worship the gods of the Canaanites. Would not truly be a follower, not truly understand what it means to be an Israelite, to be of God's people. That's what the author of Hebrews is identifying here. That it is possible for those who come to Christ in the first place to not truly be his. To come to him and fall away because they were never truly sharing in that Holy Spirit. Or in sharing in that Holy Spirit in a way in which they had chosen to be a part of God's people in the first place. And so they tasted the heavenly gift. They came and, and, and witnessed the work of the Holy Spirit. They tasted God's good words and the powers of, of the work of God. But they chose the world instead. And they fell away from what God was doing. And in that case, it is true with what John is saying here, with jo what Jesus is saying through John's gospel, that everyone whom the Father gives the Son Everyone who sees and believes will have eternal life. Everyone who sees and believes will be raised up on the last day. He will not lose any of us who have chosen him as our Lord and Savior, who have made him and accepted him as our great high priest to stand before God eternally and say, I have made the sacrifice for them. I have cleansed them. I have done the work for them. Everyone who consciously makes that decision, who is a part of God's people and is not just doing it in a way to check off a box and then go back and choose their life that they want to live instead of offering their life to Christ. Those people are God's people. But the teaching that the, the author of Hebrews is trying to go on but further than, because remember, he's saying, let's, let, let us not remain here in the elementary teaching of what it means for Jesus to be a high priest. Let's go a step further and say, it is possible that some of you might have said that he was your high priest, but instead haven't really made him so. And this should raise a flag for us. Because how often do we claim Jesus as high priest? Do we claim him as our sacrifice? Do we claim him as our Lord? but then go chase the world instead. But then go and live for other things instead. Let's choose Christ. Let's make him our Lord and Savior. Let's allow him to be the forerunner on our behalf, the one who goes into the most holy place on our behalf. Let's make him the Lord, author, and perfecter of our faith that we can be firmly established in what he does for us as our high priest. I'd encourage you, if you haven't already, to make sure to take time to read through Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 6, verse 20, and, and study what this means, and dig into it a little bit, and, and dive into John chapter 6, uh, verses 37 through 40, in, in the discourse that Jesus gives on, on the Father's will and, and his role as bringing God's people back to him. And then join us next week as we continue this study. Next week we'll be digging into ch Hebrews chapter 7. So that's the entirety, verses 1 through 28. And this is where we really get to, like we said, in the chiastic structure, the, the main thrust. The next two weeks we'll be getting into the main thrust of what the teacher in Hebrews is identifying as the pinnacle of our faith with Jesus as our high priest, Lord, and Savior. And, and what it means that he's not only our high priest, but he is our atonement sacrifice. And so I hope you continue on. I hope you continue joining us. And I'm looking forward to going further in this study along with you. We'll see you next time.